Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Today we'll be talking about customer success and specifically around the value that they provide throughout the entire customer journey. We're lucky to be joined by Allison Pickens, COO at Gainsight, as well as Sam Lee, who's the head of customer success and support at Keep Trucking. So Allison, the role of customer success has become much more broad in terms of it's a cultural phenomenon in uh, customer centricity has become the theme yeah. uh, across the entire org. Talk a little bit about that. Definitely. Um, so in terms of uh, introduction to myself, quick background, uh, currently I'm COO at Gainsight, as you mentioned. I joined Gainsight after my old investment firm, um, Bank Capital, on the venture side led the Series B round back in uh, late 2013. And uh, we you know, had a million in ARR at the time. It was very small. Uh, today, we're about 650 team members around the world. It's been just a tremendous um, journey that we've been on. And it's, it's paralleled the journey, I think, that customer success has been on over that time period. Uh, you know, when we started out, there were very few people with the title customer success. Right. Um, actually, before I joined, our, our company hosted a conference and tried to amass all the people in the Bay Area who had the customer success title. I think they succeeded in getting something like two to 300 people to be in a room together. And um, what, from what I hear, even the people in the room didn't really know what customer success meant. They were all you know, envisioning what it could be, but trying to figure that out together. Um, so you know, back then, the metrics for customer success weren't well defined the job description of customer success wasn't defined, the expectations for a, an executive who would lead this team not defined. There weren't many chief customer officers at all. I think there may be just a couple of people who had that title. And, uh, and I, I'd also say that um, customer success management was, to be honest, kind of at the bottom of the totem pole in a lot of companies. They didn't have a seat at the executive table, not a lot of influence, not a lot of ability to get budget. Today we're in a dramatically different world, um, and I, you know, I, I like probably both of you like speak to a lot of founders who are just so excited about investing in customer success. They think customer centricity, as you said, is one of their biggest priorities, and they believe that the customer success functions can be instrumental in in making that centricity happen. Great, and so Sam, you've joined us from Keep Trucking, and you know, Scale was an earlier investor in Keep Trucking, and to say that they've grown quickly would be a massive under statement, I would say. So you know, I'd love to just to hear a little bit more about when you started uh, customer success at Keep Trucking and what did that journey look like? It's been quite a journey, uh, indeed. Um, so when I first joined a little over two years ago, we had about 2,000 customers, about seven account managers, not CSMs uh, at that point. Um, today, we're over 50,000 customers uh, and, and the CS team uh, at large is about um, almost 100 people now serving both up market and down market. Um, and so have gone through the evolutions of, of figuring out what a proper um, you know, customer life cycle looks like, how do we engage these customers from an up market and down market perspective, um, and, and making sure that you know, those folks are equipped and we're, we're uh, delivering success for our customers as well. Great. So the role that customer success plays in the acquisition phase of the customer lifecycle can often be overlooked. But in my experience with working with our portfolio companies, oftentimes the best customer success organizations have that as part of their remit. So Allison, I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about that. Um, how do you see across all of your customer base, customer success, taking some of the data and improving that signal to noise ratio and helping contribute to the sales organization to help them find the right customer. Definitely. Um, so I think there are two key ways in which customer success can help. One is that um, so much of selling to the right customer is about setting expectations properly during the sales cycle. Yeah. Um, we often sell to the wrong customer because we've overpromised, and therefore those prospects think that actually we're a certain kind of company, we you know, have a certain kind of product that's suitable for a company that's like them, when really that may not be the case. So when customer success managers are involved in the sales cycle in some way, they can help ensure that those expectations are set properly. Um, they may not have to be actually in a sales meeting, but they can help design materials for sales that help set expectations for what will happen in onboarding. For example, uh, that, that content or the CSM themselves can say things like, uh, here's the effort that's required to implement and maintain our software over time. Yep. Here are the kinds of people that you need to have in your organization to support it. Um, here are the key attributes of the best customers that we've had. 
Um, and then after the, the sales cycle has been completed, you've closed the deal, we often find it helpful to send out a survey to that new client, maybe about 60 days after the close, that asks on a scale of one to five, how closely has your experience in onboarding matched the expectations that were set during sales? And actually in the past, we've offered bonuses to our sales representatives when they achieve a five wow, on, on that survey, great. right? <laughs> Which is really cool. you know, great, I think a great incentive for them and um, helps ensure that we're all aligned ac across the journey. I think the second way in which customer success can help make sure that we're targeting the right customers is that, as I think you alluded to, there's so much data that's gathered over the course of the customer journey. And um, when you start to dive into that data, you might notice as a CS organization that there are certain clusters of customers that tend to behave similarly. They might be customer segments traditionally defined by number of employees, but they might be defined by different attributes too. You know, it might be that um, there's a certain industry lens, um, a certain um, business model or revenue model lens that influences how a customer is able to achieve success with your product. What are the different types of customers? Um, and, and then you can start to actually correlate retention with each of those clusters, adoption, and it can help inform your target market. Yeah, and Sam, like, in practice, how has customer success evolved in terms of like helping with the acquisition engine and thinking through, hey, are these the right customers for us to be going after and setting the right expectation like Allison mentioned? You know, between sales and CS, um, those organizations need to work very tightly together um, to, to, again, set the right expectations, but then hold them accountable, like you were saying. Um, so making sure, let's say in the kickoff process like we do, ensuring hey, we trust that sales is selling the right deals, but um, we're accountable to that. And so therefore we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that on the kickoff, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, clearing the air with the customer. These are the expectations. This is what we're gonna deliver, making it very clear up front. And, and going into your point, Dale, about you know, the data that we use, we try to gather as much as possible uh, into our CRM. So um, in terms of trial wins and losses, um, and as, as we, um, kind of go through the life cycle with the customer, what are the NPS scores that we gather from them? Are they, are they healthy, are they not in terms of their usage? Um, that all feeds into, hey, this could be a really good time uh, to, to pitch an upsell. Um, or, or perhaps not, like this is very much the wrong time for it. Um, and so all those inputs are extremely important to figuring out, um, you know, are we really serving the customer the way they should be um, and, and um, helping them to succeed again? Yeah, um, and so one of the things that the challenges that I find in our portfolio companies is that there's a lot of people that are actually touching customers nowadays. Yeah. You have marketing, which is you know pushing the marketing message. Product marketing is putting you know positioning statements out there. Sales is obviously talking to them along the way, and customers are customer success is talking to them along the way. Allison, any advice that you have around like how do you keep people in their swim lanes and make sure that not only are they you know, singing from the same book, but also coordinated in their efforts. Definitely. I think this is really what customer success more broadly defined is all about, as you alluded to earlier. It's really about how do all these functions work together in service of the client. We often use this analogy to a symphony orchestra to describe how these functions should work together. Everyone's playing a different instrument, whether it's the tuba or yeah. the violin, but you have the same sheet music. And I think the key is ensuring that there is you know, a conductor that's actually like, you know, communicating the sheet music effectively to everyone else. Of course, we use our own system for that. Um, there are, you know, other systems that can be used too. Um, I think the key is making sure that um, you have especially OKRs that are assigned to each function that um, bubble up toward company goals. And, um, you know, OKR is, is a concept that uh, refers to objectives and key results. It was created by John Doerr, like championed at Google. Um, we use that internally. The idea is that at a, as, a, as a company, you want to have a certain limited set of OKRs, which are essentially priorities for your business that are measured through a certain metric or key result. Then those should be cascaded to different functions within your organization. So for example, if your goal is to improve your, you know, your gross margin on your, your software subscription, uh, there are probably a few different things that go into that. Uh, you know, there might be a cascading OKR that goes to your support team to become more efficient since support tends to go into COGS. There might be um, an OKR that goes to your engineering team to become more efficient in tech ops. 
Um, and there might be an OKR that actually goes to your product team to ensure that the product becomes easier to use so that you don't have to hire as many support people, you don't have to have you know, as many escalations. So through the OKR framework, you can start to see actually how um, customer centricity can be applied to many different functions and service of not just your uh, you know, P&L items, but also in service of your clients. Sam, any secret sauce that you have in terms of just like helping the sales team convert and using customer success as part of the sales engine to help convert new customers onto the platform? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's um, a lot of uh, tools and resources that we can give to sales in terms of, hey, these are um, this is the expectation of how we work with you post sales um, and, and setting very clear expectations of you will have an executive business review, for instance, um, it, especially in our industry um, in kind of transportation, uh, it, like it's kind of unheard of, right, to get a nice PowerPoint deck um, showing here are the value uh, here are the value points of what we're doing for you efficiency-wise and, and things like that. Um, so that's that's really critical to sell the value for sales on um, on the service that they will receive. Um, and, and really um, getting sales to know, hey, these are the wins that we have with our customers, right? Take this, we'll work with marketing, turn these into case studies. Um, so we actually have OKRs around uh, the number of case studies that we can help generate to equip sales to further, um, you know, to further our sales, um, and then, and then from a different lens, I'd say also it's not just like the new revenue, but we're, we're certainly focused on upsell, uh, which is really exciting for us too. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but from not only from the CS lens, but from the support lens, there's a lot that we can do as a business to uh, to ensure that. Um, you know, we know when customers are interested and, and we're uh, proactively trying to uncover those situations and, and get them over to sales as quickly as possible too. I want to build on something you said about case studies because I, I think that goal that you had is just, it's so important um, and it, it's so indicative of how actually leveraging your customers can help you grow faster, right? Absolutely. Like I think so often in customer success we're asking things of other teams, asking the product management team to make our lives easier, like asking the sales team not to sell to the wrong customers, but like actually case studies and other types of ad advocacy are, is an area where customer success can be helping other folks. Um, we, we've had this uh, term that we've been calling uh, CSQA. Uh, it's, it's sort of a riff on CSQL, which yeah. is a more common acronym. I think, do you guys use that? Yeah, yeah, CSQL? Yeah, yeah. yeah, customer success qualified lead. Yeah. It's like an upsell lead. It sounds like yeah. we'll get to, back to that later. CSQA uh, for us is customer success qualified advocacy. Mm -hmm which um, could be a case study, right. it could be um, a customer agreeing to serve as a reference, uh, it could be customer speaking at an event, and, uh, and we have a target for that um, every quarter. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and Dale, uh, going back, in terms, of, in terms of sales, I do want to bring up just how critical it is uh, to have a really strong relationship between the two organizations again, because um, we can generate the advocacy and things like that, but if, if sales is still kind of missetting expectations or things. Um, it's, you know, it's detrimental ultimately. And so I think to have, have the sales team understand, I think the most successful ones are the ones that understand, hey, it's not just about closing that initial deal. It's, we know that this is recurring revenue. It's important to protect that revenue. And if they're aligned in terms of that mindset, it, it just becomes great to work with them to say, Hey, these are some examples where we found um, some missteps or mis-expectation settings, and and they are quick to adjust on their end. Um, so, so that's pretty key. That's awesome. So, sales has closed the deal, and the company has gotten the PO at this point. One of the critical junctions between sales and customer success is that point of transition the on, from passing off from sales to customer success and thinking about the onboarding process. Um, it's usually not as cut and dry as that, and I actually advise our portfolio companies that it's not, hey, I'm passing you off, but for simplified purposes, it might be a good way to think about it. How, Allison, how do the best functioning organizations across you know, what you've seen in Gainsight's customers think about that? Definitely. Yeah. Um, onboarding is the most critical period in the customer journey. Hands down, it's the most important, um, most important stage. And I think the reason is because it's the customer's essentially first real experience with your company that has a lot of depth. Certainly the sales process is very yeah. important, but there's so much more of an intense experience during onboarding. Um, and it's often you know, during that period when a customer will end up 
churning or not. And, and it, it might be that they take many months to issue their churn notice, but right. that churn is determined during the onboarding period. Um, one of the, the best practices that we tend to see in organizations that are great at onboarding is they have a measure of time to value. Uh, time to value is one of those measures or, or concepts I think that people have been talking about for a long time. They talk about the importance of time to value, but they don't measure it. And if you're not measuring something, chances are it's actually not that important in your organization. It's not a focus. Right. Um, that's not always true, but I, I often see that. So um, we've seen uh, great companies create measures like uh, a certain definition of initial value. It might be measured through um, a health score or uh, a certain type of adoption that especially correlates with strong gross retention. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should expect to achieve that threshold, of that adoption or health score within a certain amount of time. Um, and so essentially that ratio of you know, the adoption to time is, is what we're looking for when we're measuring time to value. Right. And so for enterprise customers, is there a, you know, is there an idea of a perfect or prototypical CS organization, or does it really vary? I mean, you've talked about time to value and those types of metrics, but like from a functional perspective, are there certain roles that you see in an enterprise space uh, that you might not see in an SMB space? And we, you know, we'll talk with Sam about that. Definitely, and, and I think um, the organizational structure can vary dramatically, um, particularly during the onboarding process, uh, but I'll, I'll list sort of different parts of the spectrum. Um, I've seen companies where um, it's so important to offer strategic guidance to their clients and manage that engagement to uh, strong time to value uh, that they'll have a services team that's engaged for the first year. Um, and these are people who are coming from Deloitte or McKinsey or people who are very skilled in managing executive relationships and very complex engagements. Um, and you know, it might seem like anathema to a software company to have a significant services arm, but if it propels your growth and it makes your clients successful, let's do it, right? Like we ought to do what drives success. On the other end of the spectrum, I've seen organizations that have um, no dedicated onboarding function, no services, and customer success management that looks actually a lot more like account management, it's a bit more transactional than driving value for clients. And you're able to get away with that when your product drives so much value out of the box that you really just don't need as many people. The product experience is strong enough to generate the kind of outcomes and gross retention that you're looking for. Great. So Sam, you know, Keep Trucking has a very, uh, I'll call it a unique customer base, at least compared with other SaaS companies that folks are used to hearing about. Um, and you mentioned earlier on that you know you had started with account managers, but have moved into you know this idea of customer success. Talk a little bit more about how you guys um, think about customer success in the onboarding process, given the you know vast number of customers that you guys have. Yeah, pretty early on, um, we we had to segment um, very quickly um, again to kind of up market and down market. And so, up market, we've we've evolved um, to incorporating time to value um, to make sure we have a proper uh, handoff from sales um, and into defining in the first ninety days. These are the expectations, um, and that even that has evolved uh, up market over time. Where it was at first kind of um, we have a product that ships out, it's it's almost akin to like a B2C product because it's it's a hardware device that people can actually just you know plug in and use very easily themselves. Um, but working with these with these fleets and these customers um, to really understand from hey it's not just turning on the device and flipping the switch you know, uh, that's that's not the success measure for you guys. What is it? What do you guys want to drive um, long term for your business? How can we partner with you? And so we uncover those things from the get go during the kickoff and we partner with them to make sure that we are driving that value, setting that right expectation and, and delivering on that um, kind of in the first 90 days. Um, and then if we switch to, to down market, um, this is the, the SMBs and, and kind of the, the mom and pops, right? The, the person who owns their truck, they own their business, and they're driving on the road every day. Uh, and so that interaction is very different, right? It's, it's very difficult to have um, kind of, hey, an hour long kickoff call, you know, that, that is certainly not scalable. And so we provide uh, kind of all the means and content necessary for them to be able to um, uh, build value, uh, install the product, use it properly, um, and then and then at the same time, you know, uh, we, we have webinars, and we have kind of layers of, uh, of touches yeah. um, to make sure that, that the customer can get to where they need to get to. And ultimately, 
hey, if they're still having trouble, we're there, we're proactively calling and reaching out to make sure they can, they can get that value. Yeah, and how do you guys measure um, time to value? Um, any, you know, advice, and any advice that you have in terms of improving that? Yeah, good question. Um, so, again, we, we kind of segmented differently based on, based on um, the size of the customers and, and how we work with them. But down market, it, you know, it, the look and feel is more transactional, right? It goes back to what percentage of their devices that they have out there are, um, are activated. Um, and and we're, we're continuing to refine that to say, hey, now let's incorporate this feature because that's a signal in churn. Um, and, then, and then more up market, um, we've had to customize a lot more. And, and I think that's right to do with the customers, right? To, to understand, um, you know, in the early days, it used to be hit X percent activation, um, but we found, you know, it's not a one size fits all, especially in the enterprise. So, so it's, what is that activation period that you're looking, or that rate that you're looking at um, in that certain time period, but what else are you looking for here? Um, what is the number of hours and time savings that you're looking at, or the reports that you need um, in place? Things like that, um, that we can really customize and help deliver. I have a follow-up question to that. Actually, I'm so curious to know, like in, in your SMB segment, when, when you talked about the kind of automation that you have, like the content that you produce, did you start out by having people serving that segment um, to learn what to build, or did you have a more automated uh, automation first approach? Yeah, uh, great question. We had very few people um, trying to just triage, and yeah. there was a ton of thrashing involved um, to, to try and handle kind of uh, escalations, pain points, and, and really just focus on uh, getting them activated. And so um, I knew that coming in, uh, we wanted to get a, a really scalable model in place, yeah. um, and especially focused on SMBs, um, just making sure that we have the right resources in place for them content-wise. So we're hitting them with the proper emails, the proper in-dashboard messages, all that stuff to equip them to say, hey, you can do what you need to do, uh, but we're here for you if, if not, uh, if, you know, if you need additional uh, love and, and touch, so. Awesome. Yeah, great advice. And Allison, you know, have, you seen any like if you have any do you have any advice for people during the onboarding period first 90 days for six days whatever that onboarding period is what are some of the common pitfalls that you see that you just want like if we were to tell our portfolio or even other startups out there avoid this save yeah. yourself the headache don't do this is there anything that you could say is universally true or Good question. You know, sometimes it is really simple uh, the list of things yeah. not to do. For example, don't ask a question of the client that the salesperson already asked in pre-sales. Yeah. Um, that simple re-asking of a question makes the client feel devalued, like no one was listening, like you guys aren't coordinated. So uh, it's important actually for your sales team to keep notes, keep a record, have an internal handoff call, make sure the onboarding person is super well prepared. Right. Um, I think there's a whole set of things that are important to do uh, just for, for etiquette in meetings show up five minutes in advance if you're on a call to make sure that you're there when the customer joins the call, send out an agenda in advance. Um, I think those small signals in the early days go a really long way. Right. Um, a few other things i recommend would be assign an executive sponsor for those accounts that are above a certain threshold in terms of size or part of like your larger customer segment and have that executive participate in an early conversation. You can have steering committee meetings as well for your enterprise, enterprise clients along the way where executives from both sides can get involved. Um, the final thing is it's really important during onboarding to have a strong point of view on which features correlate with strong outcomes and gross retention. You have to know what are those features that you are going to enable your client to use during the onboarding period and your onboarding specialist needs to know what processes that they can roll out in order to encourage adoption of those features. That's fantastic advice, Allison. And so talking about customer retention, you know, that's obviously one of the core parts of what customer success is charged with doing. Sam, how far in advance do you guys start thinking about renewals? Does it vary by segment? Any best practices that you have there? Yeah, in terms of thinking about retention, um, goes back to what Allison said. I mean, it starts from day one, really, in, in pushing on um, what do they, what are their needs? What do they uh, want to achieve? Um, but also, um, from our signals and from our data, uh, what do they need to be um, engaged with in order to make sure that we can secure that outcome as much as possible? That said, uh, for upmarket customers, 
typically we reach out 90 days in advance. Um, we want to have that discussion with them, with their decision maker, with all the stakeholders from the customer's end, because it really shouldn't be a surprise. Right? When we have that discussion with them, we want to lay out, hey, this is coming up in 90 days. This is all the great work that we've done for you um, in partnership. And, and these are the things that, that we're looking forward to. And, and at, hopefully at that point, it's, it's an easy discussion from there. But if not, um, that's the whole point. We don't, we don't want to sweep anything under the rug. We want to know about those landmines um, so that we can try and address them within that, that 90 day, remaining 90 day period. Um, on the down market side, because it's a lot more transactional at that point, um, we, we send uh, kind of a 30-day notice to folks, and, and we will absolutely work with those folks who, um, yeah, who have some concerns or questions and things like that. Great. And so, you know, as investors and board members, you know, we sometimes have the unrealistic expectation that all of our subscription-based companies will have 100% retention rates. But what have you seen, you know, your customers do, or even Gainsight do, that has made it easier for you guys to forecast better in terms of like what what will that retention rate be you know three six nine months from now definitely well i'm really happy that boards are starting to emphasize the importance of long-term uh, renewal forecasting it's pretty interesting to think about the difference between sales and customer success in terms of the fork the, the focus on forecasting if you ask a, a sales leader what makes you good at your job, uh, or how do you know you're good at your job, the number one thing they would say is whether they can forecast. And I've, I've interviewed my share of sales leaders, so I, I've, I've heard this many times in interviews. But if you interview a chief customer officer or customer success leader about what makes them great at their job, it's pretty rare that they will say, I can forecast retention really well. It's just, it's not commonly said. But I do believe that in the future, that's a critical, um, attribute of a very successful executive. Um, and I think you need great tools for it. You know, it's, it's very commonly known that in the sales world, there are certain forecasting tools that you use that apply like machine learning, as well as the subjective insight from your reps and your managers. And, you know, in customer success, of course, at Gainsight, we're very focused on this. Um, I think that, you know, the way I would recommend doing this is, first of all, you know, when, when you look, when you're doing your, your strategic planning in, in the lead up to the next fiscal year, um, you've got to do a, a very like bottom up analysis, renewal by renewal of um, what you're expecting for the next four quarters mm -hmm. um, or even six quarters if you're starting financial planning, you know, in the August, like, you know, August time frame or so. Um, and I'd recommend besides using a system, ensuring that you have a subjective assessment from your CSMs or your account managers about every single account. What is the percentage likelihood that this account is going to renew next year? Now, obviously, if you have an SMB customer segment, you can't do that for every single renewal. And in that case, it really is about applying data science. Um, actually, before we had a tool for this, we had an internal data science team that literally did the correlation analysis to see, you know, how does NPS adoption, support tickets, all these signals, how do they um, correlate with the likelihood of renewal? And we were able to figure out that actually um, our, our primary health score uh, that you know, if, if you were in like a green health score, you'd have a certain percentage likelihood to renew. If you weren't in green, you'd have another uh, percentage likelihood to renew. That way, we're able to forecast our SMB segment. And then on the enterprise mid-market side, we were doing like that bottom-up analysis. Right. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing on the SMB side um, with partnering with the data science team. Um, oh, and then to your point on on the kind of uh, the high-touch side or the up-market side, um, you know, having great tools in place to understand uh, what are the kind of automated health scores that come out that can help inform if these customers are going to renew or not. And then certainly le leaning heavily, heavily on uh, CSMs because um, they're, they're so close to that relationship and they know whether or not um, you know, things are going sideways or, or going really well. So the expectations for growth within startups has just gotten higher and higher every single year. I mean, I've seen it from you know back in the 2000s to today. Companies are growing four times as fast at the same at the same stage of at the same stage and scale. How do you guys balance that? How do you think about customer success, which is charged with developing customers for life and having this long-term relationship with customers, versus sales, which oftentimes can be you know characterized as like sell, 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 sell. Um, sometimes that can create a conflict. W any thoughts on that? We're, we're focused on retention. When customers come in the door, um, we're not going to be able to upsell them more if if they're just walking out. Um, and, and so, in my mind, um, 
you know, the retention is number one and, and kind of the upsell piece is, is number two, but, but they're very closely aligned in that um, if, if we have the customer's uh, end goal in mind and, and we want to see them you know, succeed long term, um, we should have uh, products and services that can help them achieve that. Um, and so it should be a very natural discussion of understanding what their goals are on a regular type of cadence, at least quarterly. Um, and then, and then, you know, being that trusted advisor, being that, you know, being that consultant to them to say, hey, we have these other things here that can really help you in, in, in these areas. Um, and, and so I think in that way, um, the partnership kind of grows even stronger with the customer and with the sales team because we're, uh, on our end, we're, we're generating, you know, lots of leads um, that, the sales team loves, right? Who, who doesn't love a warm lead? It's really smart. In general, I see a lot of customer success teams acting more like sales, and I see sales teams acting more like customer success, which I think is because of what you said that, you know, in customer success, we're perceived as being, if we're doing our jobs well, a trusted advisor. And if we recommend a product to a client, we're doing it from a place of actually genuinely believing it's in the best interest of the client. Obviously they can make their own assessment as to like whether they think that's the case, they can challenge us on that. But, and we, you know, if we're doing our jobs well, we're also not recommending the product in cases where it's not going to be valuable, right? Um, actually, I, I, I think that, um, Sales for many people, um, sometimes in customer success as well, has a bad name, right? It's like, oh, you know, you're selling someone something that's like creepy or scammy or like you have some ulterior motive or, um, and I think that's a very old way of, of thinking about sales actually. Like if you're selling well, all selling means is like being persuasive about something you actually really believe in. Right. Interestingly, on the sales side, I'm seeing a lot of salespeople actually um, sometimes refer to themselves as customer success people. Like you sometimes see the customer success title being applied to a salesperson in pre-sales even. Um, and you're seeing them, I think, being a lot more consultative, which I think helps their cause more. Yeah. So going back to, I had a comment earlier around swim lanes and I think upsell, you know, we're seeing more and more upsell coming out of CSMs and CSMs thinking about uh, taking on more of a sales mentality and thinking about how they can deepen that customer relationship. But at the same time, you have marketing messages coming through Marketo or HubSpot. You have you know, sales and sales development messages coming from you know, an outreach or a sales loft. And then you know, customer success messages coming from a gain site or somebody else. Any advice that you have for how people should be thinking about engaging with the customer to help identify when is the right time to start talking to them about increasing their usage or adding another product. Definitely. This is, we were talking informally before this recording, but this is probably one of the most challenging problems that I think folks face in um, the post-sale world is how should marketing and customer success work together or take on different responsibilities with respect to upsell. Um, you know, typically what I see is that marketing teams tend to be, although not always, focus on the top of the funnel. That's often where their skill set is. Uh, it's what the tools they use are oriented toward. Whereas customer success tends to be focused more on what is the nature of this client situation? What are their objectives? What are the different segments of our clients? And how can we best encourage them to get value and also ultimately buy more for us, more from us? So in most companies, I think it makes sense for customer success to own revenue post-sale and um, you know be the ones responsible for teeing up new product sales for the client, teeing up new license sales, uh, you know, sending out email communications or in-app messaging that uh, paves the way toward upsell leads um, that could ultimately be closed by a salesperson but um, are teed up you know, principally by customer success. That being said, if truly we're honoring this principle of you know, customer success as a symphony orchestra where like every function is working together, leveraging their core skill set, and it turns out that a marketing team actually is quite aware of you know, the customer environment and um, have the expertise to generate leads post-sale, um, it could make sense for marketing to be the one-to-many complement um, to a customer success team, which is more, in this case, more oriented around the human interactions that might lead the way to upsell. I'm curious to get your take, though. You guys have thought a lot about this. I, I very much agree with you uh, in, in terms of, you know, we own the revenue, right? Customers own kind of the customer-generated revenue. Um, and so um, 
I see this as having kind of a clear line, right? There, there's a line in the sand that says, hey, if you're going to market to our customers or, or if sales, you're, you're running this new deal or something like that, please, please make sure everything kind of comes through us to make sure that we're filtering out these messages or we're giving you the proper customer list to go and attack. Um, so, so there's been a lot of that kind of collaboration with marketing and with sales when we have kind of a joint promotion that happens um, to make sure that, um, that we're properly targeting. Um, and then, Allison, to your point on um, on marketing, I could also see a realm where, if if there's uh, in a, you know in organizations where there's a customer uh, focused marketing person um, who just owns you know driving leads top of the funnel for just purely customers, I think that can work because that person would be closely intertwined with CS. Yes. Um, but when they're not, that becomes a big challenge. So, any parting thoughts that you have, um, you know, for early stage founders, how how should they think about getting customer success right from the start? I'll say the number one thing, um, in my point of view, is having a senior leader on the executive team who's a peer to sales, a peer to product, peer to marketing, who's focused on customer success. If you've got that presence on your executive team, everything else will fall into place. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that 100. percent And um, bring them in early. I think um, the earlier you bring in someone, um, they can help set the right foundation, uh, the right structure for, for the size of company that, that you're in. Um, and that's pretty critical to get it you know, as right as possible from the get-go as opposed to um, bringing in someone later, having to you know, scrap things. And ultimately, you're leaving dollars on the table, right? Um, you're you're uh, increasing churn uh, potentially, or or leaving upsell dollars on the table um, without that right leader in place to, to be thinking about it from that lens. So yeah. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Sam. Uh, this has been super helpful. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely.